Hello, I'm Brian Farragher. I'm currently the Senior Lecturer in Medical Statistics at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. My task over the next hour is to try and take you through some of the basic concepts and ideas that may get asked in the statistics question when you do your MRCP1 exam. Now, although it says statistics on that, that first overhead, I will actually be covering a little more than that. I'll go into the area of epidemiology and evidence-based medicine. It's going to have to be very rushed run through this because there's a lot of material. I hope you pick up some useful tips for the MRCP exam, but also some useful ideas when you come to analyze data for real. I just want to start with this quotation from the blind watchmaker. I just want to make the point here that statistics is all about probabilities. We collect data in clinical research and then we do probability calculations on that data to try and make sense out of what we've collected and to try and draw some inferences and move scientific knowledge on from those probability uh, calculations. Now this is an algorithm that I derived back in the 1980s when I worked at Manchester Medical School. It's now all over the internet, it's in textbooks, people bring it to me and ask me have I seen it. It's one of those things that's kind of got out of control um, but there it is, it is mine. If you see it in any context, um, you now know where it came from. What I try to do in this algorithm is just demystify a little the whole statistical analysis process and try to make the point that actually statistics is not as complicated as people sometimes think it is. Essentially, when you're doing statistical analysis, when you're answering questions on statistics, there are a number of key questions you have to, to ask yourself. First of all, is the data that you're collecting categorical or continuous? If it's categorical, you have the left arm of the algorithm to go down. If you think your data is continuous, then you have to make a decision, does it have a normal or a non-normal distribution? And when you've made that decision, you can go down the middle or the right arm of the algorithm. There are no horizontal lines on this algorithm. Once you've answered those two questions, everything falls neatly into place. The first thing you do is summarize the data. That's essential because if you don't summarize your data, you don't know what's happened. And then having summarized the data, you go on to do significance tests. Now, I apologize that that had to go on to two slides. It's just too long to go on one and to see it in one go. Now, a question that has been asked in the past on, on in MCQ questions, not recently, but it has been asked is, what is the difference between parametric and non-parametric statistics? Essentially, for an MRCP1 exam, if the word parametric comes up, you can assume that they mean that the variable that's in the, in the, uh, the stem of the question is continuous and has a normal distribution. Everything else at this stage can be considered as non-parametric. That's an approximation, but it will work. Now, just a quick word about probability, because probability is the cornerstone of everything in statistics. Probability is just the likelihood that an event will occur. If the event can't occur, the probability is zero. If the event must happen, the probability is one. If you've bought a ticket for the next lottery, the probability you will win is somewhere between naught and one. All real probabilities are. The probability you win the lottery is much nearer to zero than it is to one. Now, sometimes in MCQ questions, they will try and confuse you between a probability and a correlation coefficient. I'll deal with correlations later, but just for the moment, probabilities can only run from zero to one. They cannot be negative. Correlations also run from naught to one, but can also be negative and run down to minus one. So they just try and confuse you on that very simple issue. Now, I just want to quickly go through the differences between different types of data. What is continuous? What is categorical? Seems simple. Sometimes it isn't. Continuous data is essentially data which has a number that means something. So if you see that a patient's diastolic blood pressure is 95 millimeters of mercury, you interpret that. That number means something to you. If it goes up to 110, you interpret that change and the new number. So you take into account it's gone up from 95 to 110. Now suppose you don't like the number 95. There's nothing you can do about that. That is the number you have to use. So that's continuous data. And that silly statement will be made obvious, I hope, in a second. Because when we look at categorical data, this is a good example of categorical data. If we're recording the sex or the gender of a patient, we, we record it as male and female, and we will apply numbers to those 
because the computer programs that do statistical analysis require that. Now here, we don't have to use Norton 1. We could use something else. If you don't like Norton 1, and I've had people in my office over the years who don't, then if I wanted to, I could change that to 1 for female and 2 for male. It doesn't matter. We're just using numbers as labels. And if you're in an MCQ question situation and you're not sure, is this continuous or categorical, ask yourself the question, can I change the numbers? If you can't, it's almost certainly continuous. If you could change the numbering system, it will be categorical, and that will sort it out. Now, of course, there is an intermediate situation where we're trying to measure subjective things on a continuous scale, so pain's a good example of that. So what we do with pain is we use a categorical measure but what we now do is we apply numbers to those categories which reflect the ordering. Now, is this categorical or continuous? It actually falls between the two. In many senses, it's categorical because I could change those numbers to naught for nil, three for mild, seven for moderate, ten for severe if I wanted to. But in general terms, this kind of data will be analysed as if it's continuous using non-parametric methods, so it would be assumed to have a non-normal continuous distribution. So let's just go back and start going through the algorithm. The first thing we do is summarize data. Now, for categorical data, it's easy. We just calculate the frequency count. That's pretty straightforward. It gets more complicated when the numbers in the two groups are not equal. So what we do in this situation where we've got different size groups is to make that interpretable, we convert the actual frequency count into percentages. Now, we only do that for presentation. MCQ questions in the past have tried to trick you into believing you do the analysis of that, if you wanted to compare those two proportions, that you would do it on the percentages or the proportions, and you don't. The analysis of that data would have to be done on the numbers, not on the percentages. So again, it, it's, a, it's a point that they try and trick you upon. Now, there are two particular types of probability which come up in MCQ questions, prevalence and incidence. The memory test, I'll give you a, a, a slight help if you get confused, because. I do from time to time. Prevalence is the number of people with a disease in the population at a given moment in time. I'm currently working on a project looking at um, drug resistance to TB in Malawi. We're interested in the prevalence. How many people currently in Malawi are drug resistance to TB therapy? Incidence is the number of new cases which appear in a given period of time. And I think the word in is the key here if you're confused between the two. So in Malawi, we're also interested in the number of new people that appear to become drug resistant in a one year period of time. Both of those statistics are usually expressed not as proportions, but as the number per 100,000 of the population. It's the same thing, just made simpler to understand. Now, numbers are very boring. There's no escape from that. So what we do with numbers often is to convert them into diagrams. And this is about as exciting as presentation of categorical data gets, but this is a simple bar chart. This is showing the numbers of people who had different marital status categories in a uh, stress research project I did some years ago. And the length of the bar just represents the number of people in each category. And that's everything I have to say about categorical data. So what I want to do is to try and retain that concept but move it into continuous data. This is the same thing, but done for continuous data. Same study, stress survey. People filled out a questionnaire which gave a stress score from 0 to 100. And what we've done here is we've taken those stress scores, grouped them together into five, in, five unit intervals. And each of those bars shows how many people had stress scores in that interval. And because this is now a continuous measure, we push the whole thing together and that shows what's called the distribution of the stress scores of the data over its range. Now, this is important because once we come to continuous data, we have to decide, does this have a normal or a non-normal distribution? This has a normal distribution, and that black line is what a normal distribution looks like mathematically. As you can see, that's a very good fit. And often, that's all you need to do in real life, draw the histogram and see if the normal curve fits over it. I will come back in a moment to some other ways in which we can deal with that. Now, data isn't always normal. Sometimes you have data which is called positively skewed, and sometimes the data can be negatively skewed. If I just go back to the positively skewed, this is called positively skewed because the data is pulled out in a positive direction. 
Mathematically, as we go from left to right, numbers increase. When you draw a graph, higher numbers go to the right-hand scale. So if you see the distribution asymmetrical and the asymmetry is pulled in a positive direction, that's a positive skewness. Often, that's found to have what's called a log normal distribution. Whereas if the skewness goes the other way, if you've got the data pulled in a negative direction, that's negative skewed distribution. There are distributions which have that property but which are not of interest uh, to, in this exam. And this is the box and whisker plot. The box and whisker plot is used a great deal now in presenting data. It's a very neat way of showing the properties of data, particularly when you want to compare groups. These are the stress scores I showed you a moment ago, broken down into males and females. The top and bottom, the whiskers and on, the, on the box, the top whisker shows the largest value in the set and the bottom shows the smallest value. Some programs, the one that I used here, sometimes puts dots at the end of the whiskers. That's just to show there are observations which are more than three standard deviations away from the mean. That probably doesn't mean very much to you at the moment, but it will do a little later on, but I wanted to explain why they're there. The box is the middle half of the data, so it takes the middle half of the observations, and the black line through the box is what's called the median or the center of the data. So this is showing how the data spreads, where the bulk of the data is in the box, and then where it goes to in terms of its extremities. So what different ways can we use to summarize data? for continuous data. This is just some imaginary data from, that I've invented, but based on a real trial. The arithmetic mean is the statistic most people use. When people talk about average, they usually assume it's the arithmetic mean, but we should be more precise than that. The arithmetic mean can only be used for normal distribution. What I've done here is I've assumed that most children have a relatively few visits to their GP. One child had a lot of visits, way out. This is clearly extreme data. And you can see what happens. Without that very extreme value, the mean is two. When we add in the 20, the mean becomes four. This is a perfect example of positively skewed data. And with positively skewed data, the mean gets pulled out into the tail. And it's not stable. So we should not be using the arithmetic mean if the data is skewed. We can only use it for symmetry. Now, if you've got a positive skewed distribution, you may be able to use the geometric mean. This is used when you have a certain type of positive skewness called log normal distribution. What you do with the geometric mean is rather than add the numbers up and take the average of them in the way that you're used to, now you multiply the numbers together and take the nth root where n is the sample size. So if you see without the 20, the geometric mean is 1.73. It goes up when we throw in the 20, but nowhere near as much as it did with the arithmetic mean. So the geometric mean is much better for skewed data, positively skewed data, because it's, uh, it's stabler or more stable. If you can't assume a normal or log normal distribution, then you use the median. The median is just the physical center of the data. It's a nice stable statistic. You can see from the screen that when we've only got the eight values, the median lies between two and two. So the median would be, would be two. When we add in the ninth value, the median just moves up and becomes coincidental with the, the central value there, which is still two. So the median is nice and stable. And that could be 2,000 at the end and the median would still be two. So it's a lovely stable statistic when you've got skewness. And finally, the mode is the most commonly occurring value. It's very rarely used. Now, in addition to showing a mean value, or an average rather, for continuous data, we also have to show how much the data varies. If we have two treatments which have an average a reduction in, say, blood pressure of 50 millimeters of mercury, but one has a range of responses from, say, 10 to 20, and one has a range from 0 to 40, then although they both have the same average effect, the first one has a more consistent effect than the second. So the first drug may be preferable to the second for that reason alone. So the variation of the data is important. So what we do is, for a normal distribution, we calculate the average distance the observations are from the mean. So if we take the fourth observation, we just calculate its distance, always doing it in the same way. So we take the observation and subtract the mean. Because the fourth observation is smaller than the mean, that difference will be negative, and that's important. 
When I look at the 11th value, which is above the mean, that difference now will be positive. So what happens is that when we try to apply our definition and take the average of those differences, it always will be zero. Mathematically, that's just inescapable. So it's an easy statistic to calculate, but it's not giving us much information. We have to get rid of the minus signs. Just throwing away the minus signs doesn't work. Believe me, we've tried it, it doesn't work. So we get rid of the minus sign by squaring those differences, which gives us this statistic, which is the variance. And the variance is the average squared distance each observation is from mean. And you'll see that in all the textbooks. That's the definition of variance. It's the squared distance we want, the average distance, so we just take the square root. And the square root of the variance is the standard deviation. And the standard deviation can be considered to be the average distance each observation is from the mean. Now, that funny little squiggly equal sign is just there to indicate that mathematically that's not strictly true. But as a working definition, that's fine. Now, there's just one final problem. In the previous slide, sorry, um, I divided the sum of squares by n, the sample size. That's fine if you've studied an entire population. If, as is likely, you've only studied a random sample, the original formula will give you what's called a biased estimate. It will be slightly too small. So if you're using a random sample, you have to divide the variance by n minus 1, the sample size minus 1. It's just a mathematical requirement to ensure that you don't underestimate variance and standard deviation from a sample. And one last statistic, this is going to be important later on when I do confidence intervals. The standard error is the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. Now, good MCQ territory here to try and confuse you between which of the two is larger. So I always suggest that you write this down. If you've got a question which requires you to work out the difference between a standard deviation and a standard error, write this formula down. Standard error equals standard deviation divided by the square root of n. Because of the way in which the formula is set up, the standard deviation is larger than the standard error. Because to get the standard error, we divide the standard deviation by a positive number. And it's a measure of how accurate our estimate is when we've, can, when we've carried out a clinical trial or a survey. Now, you can only use variance, standard deviation, and standard error if you can assume a normal distribution. If you can't, those statistics don't work. Instead, you use the range, which is the smallest or largest value. Sometimes people will trim that. They'll take off the top and bottom of the data, uh, maybe take the 2.5% off each end and present the 5% trimmed range. That's just to remove very extreme values from the, the presentation. Percentiles are used to calculate normal ranges. A percentile is the value below which a given percentage of observations lie. So, for example, a 37 percentile, 37 percent of our observations will be smaller than that value. The fifth percentile, often used to determine where abnormality is, is the value below which 5 percent of observation lies. So you'll often see the 5 and 95 percent percentiles used as an indicator of normal range. And the 50th percentile, 50% of observations lie below that value, which makes it the dead center of the data, and the dead center of data is, of course, the median. So the median and the 50th percentile are the same thing. And if you go back to the box and whisker plot, um, the black line in the middle is the median, which is actually the 50th percentile. The box is the 25th to the 75th percentile, the middle 50% of the observations. So that's the box and box and whisker plot. So let's just go back and have a look at the normal distribution, and then I want to do an MCQ based on this information. Now, if you can assume that the data is, an, is normally distributed, then the mean and the median and the mode are theoretically equal. They don't usually include the mode in MCQs. They will give you information about the mean and the median. In MCQs, they rarely tell you this is a normal or a non-normal distribution. They leave you to work this out for yourself. So this is the key to doing that. If they show a mean and a median which are equal, that's the MCQ qu question setter telling you this has a normal distribution. The normal distribution is completely defined by the mean and the standard deviation. And 
In the past, they've asked you to try and remember information about the mean and the standard deviation and how much data lies within a certain distance. This is kind of going out of fashion, but I'll run through it very quickly anyway. If you travel a distance of one standard deviation away from the mean in both directions, when you get to one standard deviation, you've captured just around 68% of the data. Now, 68% is difficult to remember, but enough to remember with pin numbers and all that kind of stuff these days. So why remember another fairly meaningless number? 68% is roughly two-thirds. When they give you the answers, they're not going to be subtle. They're going to give you a right answer and some very obvious wrong answers. So you haven't got to worry, are they going to ask me, is it 66 or 68? They'll ask you, is it uh, 68 or 35? Okay, so to get, when you get out to one standard deviation, it's about two-thirds of the data. You have to remember the next one. At two standard deviations or 1.96 standard deviations, it's 95%. They're not going to quibble over 1.96 and 2. It'll be one or the other. It's 95%. And when you get out to three standard deviations, that's 97.7%. Another meaningless number to remember. No, at three standard deviations, you've got virtually everything. Okay, so at one, two, and three standard deviations, it's two thirds, 95%, virtually everything. And of course, the reason why the box and whisker plot will tell you if, there, if there's an observation more than three standard deviations away from the mean is that it's very unlikely you get observations out there, which is why it highlights it. Now, if the data is positively skewed, these relationships hold. Don't try and remember these, it's easy. You have to, first of all, work out whether you've got positive or negative skewness. Well, basically what happens is that if you've got skewness, the mean is pulled into the skewness. That's all you've got to remember. So if you're told that the data has positive skewness, the mean is pulled in a positive direction away from the median. The mean will be bigger than the median. If it's negatively skewed, then the mean will be pulled in a negative direction away from the mean. So from the median, I apologize, the mean will therefore be smaller than the median. What they often do, of course, is turn it round and they give you the value of the mean and the median and you have to work it out for yourself. If that comes up, write it down in the margin of the paper. Anyway, you've got a bit of spare room. Just write mean and median in the order that it's given. So if the mean is smaller than the median, write mean and then median. Look to see what the order is. Which side the mean is to the median gives you the direction of the skewness. It's that's just impossible to remember. Just remember about the pulling of the mean into the skewness. So let's do an MCQ based on some of that material now. We're told that anesthetic recovery time was recorded for 100 patients, all having the same type of operation. And then we're given the mean and median times, 40 and 65 minutes. You should be starting to pick up clues at this stage. The standard deviation was 50 and the range was 95. What's the best way of summarizing these data for a paper to a medical journal? Now, I have to say, I've seen all of these used in the medical journal. The question is, which is the most correct? So, let's look at the clues. The clue is in the mean and the median. As soon as you see that you've been given the mean and the median, you should know you're going to have to work out that this is uh, what kind of distribution you've got. Are the mean and the median the same? No, they're not, so this is not a normal distribution. It's either positively or negatively skewed. As it happens, it doesn't matter to the answer which it is. We just need to know it's skewed and therefore non-normal. Because the mean is smaller than the median, this is the mean, remember, is pulled in the direction of the skewness. If the mean is smaller, it's being pulled in a negative direction. It's negative skewness. But because we now have worked out that this is non-normal air data, we can't use the mean, so A, B, and C are straight out. It just leaves us with D and E. D requires a standard deviation. That can't be used for non-normal distributions. And so the only acceptable answer here is E, the median and the range. And that's all got from the information about the mean and the median. There's a lot of information in there you don't need. That's common to statistical MCQ questions. You just have to find the right information. Another question along the same lines. Response to call, time to visit prescribing and hospital admissions were recorded for 2,152 patients. And a lot more information there that you don't need. 
For patients visited at home, the mean and median times to arrival were 55.4 and 35 minutes respectively, a range of 102. We're now being asked to decide what kind of distribution these times to arrival have. So we've got to look for the clues in the data and then answer. So I'll just give you a few seconds to ponder on that. And the clue, as before, is in the mean and the median. The mean now is bigger than the mean, so it's not normally distributed. It's also not binary because time to arrival is continuous, so A is clearly out. We're really only interested in B, C and D. I've never been able to work out what E means here, valid measurements of patient care. Sometimes there are just silly answers in the statistics questions. And if it looks silly, it almost certainly is. So it's definitely not E. It can only be B, C, or D. It can't be normally distributed because the mean and median are different. The mean now is bigger than the median, so the mean is pulled out in a positive direction, so it must be positively skewed. So the answer is D. It's an upward positively skewed distribution. If you just remember the simple concepts here, these kind of questions can be really easy marks. Significance tests. We should use significance tests as a drunken man uses a lamppost for support rather than illumination. The reason I put this in is to make an important point, nothing to do with MCQs, but to make the point that you should do your significance tests to support the conclusions you're trying to make from the summary data that you've already completed. If you try and do this without the summary data, you're doomed, basically. So, significance tests. Now, with significance tests, what we're trying to do is to solve an impossible problem. If I test two treatments, and they're the same, but I test them in two different groups of people, you know from your clinical experience that patients react differently to the same treatment. So when I look at the average response to this group, and compare it to the average, group, uh, the average response to the other group, because they're different people, they will have different responses, so the average will be different. So even if the two drugs I'm testing are the same, I will find a difference. And of course, if the drugs are different, if one is better than the other, I will find a difference. So whenever I do a comparative study, I'm going to find a difference, even if there isn't one there. So to resolve that problem, we use significance testing. And what we do is we create two hypotheses. The null that there isn't a difference, and the alternative that there is a difference. A two-sided is the conventional alternative difference where we allow the difference to go in either direction. Occasionally, but rarely these days, we can have one-sided tests where we're only interested in a difference in one particular direction. If this new, very expensive drug is going to be better or taken into current practice over the old, cheap drug, it's got to be better. If it's about the same, it's going to be no interest. We might want to do a one-sided test then. So we carry out a study, get our research data, do our significance test, calculate the p-value. The p-value is the most commonly used and the least understood statistic there is. This is the only definition. MCQs have been known in the past to ask you to identify the correct definition of a p-value. This is the only one that is correct. The p-value is the probability that the data I've just collected in my study, the difference I have just found between my groups, could have occurred if the null hypothesis is true. So the p-value assumes that there is no difference in reality. And it calculates the probability of getting the size of difference that we observed in that situation. Wrong versions of the p-value will include things like significance. If you see the word significance in the definition of a p-value, it is wrong. And that's the usual trap they set to you. So just keep your eye open for that. That's the only definition that will work. So if the p-value is small, below 5%, the probability of getting the difference we've just found, if there really is no difference at all, is very, very small. It's very unlikely we could have got that difference if there isn't a difference in reality. So basically, if the p-value is very small, the probability of getting our data is very small under the null hypothesis. Our data simply does not substantiate the null hypothesis. So we reject it and say the null hypothesis therefore can't be right. And we accept that there is a difference, or a statistically significant difference, between the interventions. And the converse of that, of course, is that if p stays above 5%, 
then we have to say, well, there is still a reasonable probability of getting this difference when the null hypothesis of no difference is true, so we must accept the null hypothesis because the data substantiates that to a degree. It goes back to the blind watchmaker. This is all about probabilities on a colossal scale. Looking at the probabilities and making a decision. There are no absolute answers here. We just make a decision on the basis of balance of probabilities, which means, of course, we can get it wrong. It could be that the null hypothesis is true, there is no difference, and we find a difference. Our p-value comes down as 3%. There's still a 3% chance our difference could have occurred under the null hypothesis. So, of course, we could be getting it wrong. It could be that the null hypothesis is true. There really is no difference between our interventions. But our p-value came out at 3%. That means there's still a 3% chance we could have got that difference when the null hypothesis is true. We're going to say there's a difference when there isn't. That's what's called a type 1 or false positive result. Alternatively, and much more commonly, we, there is a difference and we fail to find it. That's what's called a type 2 error, a false negative finding. False negative is called a type 2 error. Type 1 is usually represented by the Greek letter alpha and type 2 errors by the Greek letter beta. That's not really important, but just there for completeness. The power of the study is the opposite of the type 2 error. I think you need a bit more explanation than that for that to make sense. The power of the study basically is the opposite of a type 2 error. It's the probability that if there is a clinically significant difference there between our interventions, our study will find it. So if we say the power of our study is 90%, we have set the study up in such a way that it has a 90% chance of detecting a clinically significant difference if it's there. And you need to bear in mind that just because you've got statistical significance, you don't necessarily have clinical significance, and more importantly, the other way around. If you haven't got statistical significance, it doesn't matter how big the difference is, you can't claim it as being clinically significant. So let's do an MCQ question based on those concepts. We're asked to design a trial for a new antihypertensive agent. A lot of information there about the agent, been through phase two studies, talking about relative risk reduction, examining methodology, statistical tests. This is all going to be about effectiveness of the agent. When we look at the, the answers we're given, this is all about what is the power of the statistical test. The information we're given actually in this situation is pretty meaningless. It's irrelevant to the question. We're being asked, what is the power of a statistical test? So we're given a series of options which essentially give us different definitions of power. One is right, the other are wrong. Now remember, the power of a statistical test is the opposite of a type 2 error. A type 2 error is when we say that the null hypothesis is true when it's not. It's false negative. We fail to find a difference. So, that occurs when a false null hypothesis is accepted. That's a type 2 error. So, basically, a type 2 error occurs when a false null hypothesis is accepted. We say the null hypothesis is true when it isn't. So, remember, the power then is the opposite of type 2 error. So, power is about ensuring that a false null hypothesis does not get accepted. So, have a think around that. The only possible correct answer here is the probability that we will correctly reject a false null hypothesis. Now, power is linked to sample size, and the two are inextricable. And when you are designing studies, you have to fulfill the needs of ethics committees who will require you to calculate the power and the sample size for your study. There are good ethical reasons for that. If we have too few patients in our study, there may be an important result there, but we won't find it. We will get a type 2 error. If there are too many patients studied, then we may continue past the point where we now know the answer. And if, if one treatment is clearly better than the other, then if we continue the study beyond more patients than we need, patients will receive the ineffective treatment needlessly. So it's important ethically that we get this right. Now there are lots and lots of different formulae 
for power calculations and sample size. You don't have to remember them all. You just have to remember what are the essential elements to all those formulae. Because although they're mathematically different, they have the same elements. And the following pieces of information are linked mathematically. Sample size, type 1 and type 2 error. So normally we would set type 1 error at the conventional 5% significance level. Type 2 error is usually set at 10 or 20% equivalent to a power of 90 or 80% respectively. How big a difference we want to be able to detect, which is what we refer to as the clinically significant difference, how big does the difference have to be to get excited? And if we're doing a study which has a continuous outcome measure, what is the standard deviation? And basically, to calculate the sample size, we plug the other four pieces of information into the appropriate formula inside a computer program these days, and it will tell us the sample size. Now, confidence intervals are a bridge between summary statistics and significance tests. And to a large extent, significance tests are going out of fashion and are being replaced by confidence intervals. Because confidence intervals tell us a lot about the results of a study and can be used to do significance tests. So, when we do a study, survey, clinical trial, whatever, we get an estimate. If we base that estimate on a random sample, the answer will be wrong. We need some indication of how wrong our answer might be. How inaccurate might our estimate be? To do that, we construct a confidence interval. Usually, a 95% confidence interval, it can be other values. You sometimes see 99% confidence intervals. It can be anything. The convention is just to use 95% confidence intervals. And the 95% confidence interval is the region which we construct around our sample estimate. And we can say that we can now be 95% certain that the real value, the population value, lies inside that region. So we've got our best bet at the, what the value should be, and then a region around it with which we can say with 95% certainty, well, actually, we know our best estimate is likely to be wrong, but the answer is likely to be in there. So that's our 95% confidence interval. And so for a normal distribution, and this is the only formula for confidence intervals you have to remember, is for a normal distribution, and therefore a continuous measure. The 95% confidence interval is calculated by the sample mean plus or minus 1.96 standard errors. Now, if you get asked to do this in an MCQ question, you're not going to be able to multiply a standard error by 1.96, believe me. You just need to change that to two, and that will work. So for a confidence interval, 95% width, then two standard errors works as a good first approximation to 1.96. So quick example just to, to, to demonstrate this. 56 low birth weight babies were given either special help or standard help because low birth weight babies are known to be prone to developmental problems. At, at 24 months of age, a thing called the MDI, a measure of, of development was, was applied to the babies. The babies who had special help got a mean score of 117. The standard help group got 107. So the mean difference is 10, and the standard error for that is 3.5. The 95% confidence interval, therefore, is 10, the mean, plus or minus 1.96 times the standard error. That'll be 10 plus or minus 7. The 95% confidence interval runs from 3 to 17. Now, if the null hypothesis is true, there would have been no difference between the two groups. We can be 95% certain that the real difference is between plus 3 and plus 17. The question we ask ourselves here is, does that confidence interval support the null hypothesis of no difference? No, it doesn't. So in that situation, because the null hypothesis value is not in the interval, the null hypothesis is not supported, and we can say that the difference is statistically significant. And there's another good reason why we can say that, because if you do a significance test, you use exactly the same formula just used in a different way. So the confidence interval and the significance test use exactly the same formula anyway. They are the same thing. Now, if I just quickly increase the, the standard error to 6.5 and make the confidence interval minus 3 to plus 23, now the null hypothesis value is inside that confidence interval. So because we can't exclude 0, the null hypothesis value, from that interval, we have to say the difference is not statistically significant.
And we also have to look at the width of that confidence interval and ask ourselves, the difference could be as much as 23 units on average. Would a difference of 23 units be clinically significant? If the answer to that is no, it would have to be bigger than 23 to be clinically important, then that's a true negative finding. But if 23 would be clinically significant, what we've now got here is a situation where we fail to find statistical significance, but we can't exclude the possibility of there being a clinically important difference. So this could be a type 2 error. And this is precisely why now you cannot get comparative studies published in reputable journals without confidence intervals. So let's do an MCQ question on, on confidence intervals. There has been concern expressed that low birth weight babies have impaired motor skills. 30 low birth weight babies and 30 normal birth weight babies were tested on our friend the MDI at the age of five. And the results were summarized, or rather, what is the best way of summarizing the results of that study? Got a mean for the low birth weight baby group and a mean for the normal birth weight baby groups. Again, all of those have been seen in many of the reputable journals. Which of those is the most correct? And the answer is B. When you have a comparative study, the convention now is that you should present the mean difference between the groups and a confidence interval. All of the others have been used. A suggests that you, you present the mean of each group and the confidence interval separately. No, it is just the mean difference and the 95% confidence interval for the mean difference. As I say, all of the others have and can be used. B is the most correct answer. Now, quickly, let's go through choice of significance tests. When we're choosing significance tests, if you have an MCQ which sets up a situation and says, which test is best for this situation? Two questions you ask yourself. One, have I presented with independent or dependent groups? If there are different people or patients in each group, they are independent groups. If it's a crossover study where the participants have received both treatments, it's dependent groups. Ask yourself the question, how many treatments did each participant receive? If the answer is one, it's independent groups. If it's two or more, it's dependent. That's the way to remember that. And then secondly, is this a categorical or continuous outcome measure? Work that out from the information you've got. And after that, sorry, it's just a matter of memory. For categorical measures, then we use what's called contingency table analysis. We should use the Fisher exact test. On the numbers, not the percentages. I've deliberately put the percentages in there. It's what they will do in an MCQ. The test is done on the numbers, not the percentages. We should use the Fisher exact test. That's the correct answer. But the Fisher exact test is very difficult to calculate. And so there is a thing called the chi-squared test, which is an approximation. Either of those answers are true. If they give you both, choose the Fisher exact it's unlikely they would. That was for independent samples. If it's a crossover dependent sample study, it's a thing called the McNamara test. Now, just a couple of statistics here which are quite useful in presenting the results of, of uh, categorical data. We sometimes calculate the relative risk or the difference in the relative risks. In this particular situation, we've got two groups, A and B, and we're looking at survival rate or death rates. The death rate, the risk of dying in group A, is just six divided by the total number of people in there, which is 10, so it's 60%. In group B, nine people died out of 20, so the risk of dying in group B is 0.45. So the relative risk or the risk ratio for dying in group A relative to B is the risk of dying in A divided by the risk of dying in B, which gives us a ratio of 1.33. Now, in situations that can occur, and I'll mention one shortly, we sometimes can't use that, and we have to use what's called the odds. The odds of dying in group A is calculated by dividing the number of people who died in group A by the number of people who didn't. That's the definition of an odds. The odds is the number of people with the characteristic divided by the number of people without. So the odds of dying for group A is 6 over 4, for B it's 9 over 11, and if we do the same thing and calculate the ratio, that gives us the odds ratio, and now it's 
in general terms, odds ratios are larger than relative uh, than risk ratios. And if you're testing an odds ratio or a risk ratio, the null hypothesis value is not zero now, it's changed. If you're taking a ratio of two numbers that are the same, the ratio will not be zero, it'll be one. If you divide five by five, you get one. So the null hypothesis value here will be one. For continuous measures, if you've got independent samples and you can assume a normal distribution, it's the student unpaired test for two groups, and that goes up to the one-way ANOVA if you've got more than two groups. I'm sorry, it is just a, uh, a memory test. It's in the, the uh, algorithm I showed you at the beginning of this lecture. If you can't assume a, can't assume a normal distribution, then the equivalent of a man whitney and kruskal wallace tests. But for dependent samples, again, for normal and a non-normal distribution, student unpaired or repeated measures ANOVA, Wilcoxon and Friedman. If you can't remember them, you just have to go to the next question. So, let's do a question on those. We're being asked to decide on what's the best significance test for comparing these two drugs. 30 patients, asthma. Treadmill on two occasions. Patients were randomly allocated to receive either drug A or drug P on the first occasion, and then they got the opposite on the second occasion. The distance walked in each test were found to have a normal or Gaussian distribution. The normal distribution is sometimes referred to as the Gaussian distribution after the mathematician that discovered the normal distribution. So, which test should we use in, those, in that situation? I've given you the information that you need to think about that. The two questions are, is this independent or dependent samples, continuous or categorical data? Those are our options. I'll give you a few seconds to think about those. Okay, independent or dependent groups, the patients had the treadmill test on both drug A and drug B. Remember my clue before, ask yourself how many treatments did each patient have? Each patient had two treatments, so that makes it dependent samples. What's our outcome measure? It's distance walked, is that continuous or categorical? Clearly it's continuous, and we're told it's a normal distribution. So, with the answer to the, the two main questions, plus the information about a normal distribution at the bottom, the only possible answer from those five offered is the student paired t-test. Now, everything I've done so far has been about comparing groups. Just quickly to finish off the statistics part of this, uh, this lecture, relationships. Correlation is a measure of the strength of relationship between two variables. This is a graph showing people's physical and mental health, and you can see there is a relationship between the two. A lot of variation in it, but there is a relationship there. The correlation coefficient measures mathematically how strong that is. Now, as I said to you right at the beginning of this session, correlations run from minus one to plus one. And if there's no correlation, it's zero. And there are Pearson and Spearman correlation coefficients. You use the Pearson in the presence of normal distributions, otherwise it's Spearman. And correlation does not imply cause and effect. We can take a step beyond correlation, and if we want to estimate one measure from the other, having established that they are associated, we can put a line of best fit, which is called the linear regression line through the data. And basically, the, the variable that we've measured on the vertical axis is called the dependent or outcome variable, and we try to predict that from the variable on the, on the horizontal axis, which is the independent or predictor variable. If you can assume that the outcome is continuous, the dependent variable, outcome variable, is continuous. You use ordinary linear regression. If it's binary, you have to use a thing called logistic regression. And if it's counts, we have to use what's called Poisson or negative binomial regression. So that's statistics tied up. Now let's do a little bit of epidemiology and uh, screening tests. Screening and diagnostic tests are done frequently to try and develop new measurement tools. There are five important statistics that you need to know about, and I'll quickly go through these. It's probably best to do this using a simple table. If you have a question on screening tests, two things I'm going to say. One is, if your mental arithmetic is up to it, have a go at the question. If you don't feel comfortable doing mental arithmetic, 
in an MCQ exam situation, go to the next question, okay? If you're going to do this, write or draw this table. True diagnosis in the columns and test result in the rows. And what I'm going to do here is we're going to summarize the outcome of our diagnostic test. We'll have a group of patients who will or will not have the disease. So they go in the columns. And then we'll have the results of the tests that were carried out. Some patients will test positive, some patients will test negative. Draw that, you have to get it the right way around, and then basically fill in the numbers. Now the first number that you'll be looking for will be the total sample size, and then these are the four numbers we're looking for. Just going from top round clockwise, true positive, false positive, true negative, false negative. The sensitivity of the test is the proportion of people who have the disease who test positive. And the calculation for that is shown on that slide. Specificity is the opposite of that, is the proportion of people who don't have the disease who test negative. And again, I've shown the appropriate calculation on the slide. Positive predictive value is the proportion of people who tested positive, who truly have the disease. So sensitivity and specificity were calculated down the columns. Positive predictive value is calculated along the rows, as I've shown, and you probably guessed the negative predictive value is the opposite of that, the proportion of people who were negative on the test who truly had the disease, uh, truly did not have the disease. Now, positive and, predict and negative predictive value are the, the values you will want to use in the clinic because that tells you the probability that you can believe the test result you've got. You may also be interested in the total predictive value, which is the total proportion of patients correctly identified by the test. So you probably guessed it. The negative predictive value is the proportion of people who were negative on the test who didn't have the disease. And finally, the total predictive value is just the total proportion of people who were correctly identified by the test in total to the true positives and true negatives. Now, the problem is that um, the sensitivity and specificity values, which are the headline figures, are, will, will work in any situation. The prevalence of the disease does not affect sensitivity and specificity. But the values that are really useful to you in the clinic are the positive and negative values. And the problem with those is that they are dependent on prevalence. So we do have the situation that positive and negative predictive values are what you would use in the clinic, but sensitivity and specificity, because of their robustness uh, when the prevalence changes, are the statistics which are usually quoted. But let's do an MCQ on this, um, and I'll just show you how to try and address one of these, and to kind of warn you of the problems you may get in. So, GP wants to test the accuracy of fecal alcohol blood testing for colonic carcinoma. And then we're given the information, basically, that is going to have to go in the table. So you're going to draw the table and put this information in. Because if you can do that, you've answered the question. So I'll just give you a second to think about that. So if you go back through the question, those are the pieces of information that you're given, ending up with the 358 patients who tested negative who didn't have cancer. But once you've got those numbers in there, we're asked what is the negative predictive value. The negative predictive value is the proportion of patients who tested negative who didn't have colonic carcinoma in this case. So it's the bottom row of the table that we're interested in here. We have to add in the fact it was 360. We're not told that. It's assumed you can do 358 plus 2 to get 360. So the negative predictive value is 358 patients who tested negatively, who truly didn't have the disease, divided by the total number of negative tests. 358 over 360. If you can't do that in your head, it doesn't matter. That's almost 100%. If we go and have a look at the answers, the only answer anywhere near 100% is A, 99%. They're not going to be subtle. Okay, the answer is obvious. So there's a modicum of mental arithmetic involved there, but not a lot. But if you're unhappy about doing even that kind of mental arithmetic, do the next question. Just want to finish with a few comments about design of studies. There are a number of different types of, of study that are commonly used. Surveys are used essentially to get some piece of information from a population at a particular moment in time. 
what proportion of, of, of people with TB in Malawi are drug resistant. We're going to do that using a survey and we'll collect a simple random, random sample. Sometimes simple random samples aren't enough, so you stratify the sample to make sure that you get a properly representative sample. The key thing here is to get a representative sample. At the other end of the spectrum is the randomized control trial. The randomized control trial is the gold standard for determining cause and effect, comparing treatments, comparing groups. Again, for a randomized controlled trial, we need to make sure that our population is representative of the people with the disease, if that's what we're, we're studying. We allocate patients in a randomized controlled trial to intervention or treatment by a random process to avoid bias, and there has to be a control group. We cannot determine effect without a control group. There's often confusion about efficacy and effectiveness. Efficacy is a measure of how the treatment works under ideal conditions. Effectiveness is how it works in the real world. So effectiveness takes into account things like dropouts, treatment failures, and so on. Patients must be allocated to the groups by a method called randomization. We sometimes will stratify and block a randomization to ensure that the groups that we're comparing are similar with respect to important characteristics and that the length of the, uh, the, the size of the, the two treatment groups is the same. And there is coming into play a new method called minimization, um, which uses a mathematical algorithm. It is in use. If you see it in the literature, it's a method of doing randomization, but doesn't use randomness. A randomized control trial is open if everybody knows what the treatment is. It's single blind if the patient doesn't know what treatment they've received. It's double blind if the patient and the, the assessor doesn't know what treatment the patient has been receiving. And conventionally, the statistician should also be blind to the treatment allocation when they do the analysis. That will be triple blind. It's important to blind randomized control trials to prevent subjective elements coming in when you're taking the measures of effect. Now, a crossover trial is basically where you have the same group of patients on two occasions. Remember the MCQ of the treadmill? That was a perfect example of a crossover trial. Patients get both treatments. The order of treatments is randomized. Has the limited use. The main problem of crossover trials is that you get carryover effects between the two treatments, so it's rarely used, and you have to remember if you're doing a crossover trial to use paired statistical methods. Randomized control trials should be analyzed on an intention to treat basis, so patients should be analyzed in the group they were allocated to, irrespective of what happened to them during the study. Doesn't matter what happened to them, they, they stay in that group for analysis. In certain circumstances, it may be also appropriate to do what's called a per-protocol analysis where you only analyze the patients who actually fulfill their treatment obligations. Now, it may not be ethical to do an intervention study, so we may have to do an observational study. If I wanted to do a study to see whether uh, giving zinc supplements to children increased levels of deafness, I wouldn't be allowed to do a randomized control trial because it's not ethical to give a treatment to do harm. We'd have to do an observational study. So in this situation, can we do a case control or a cohort study? A case control study, subjects are selected by their outcome. Let me go back to the, um, the, the situation I described. Instead of giving zinc supplements, let's suppose we're looking at zinc diet or, or zinc levels in diet in children. I could do this as a case control study. I will select some children who are deaf and some children who aren't, and then I will compare the cases, the children who are deaf, to the controls, the children who are not deaf, in terms of their exposure to the risk factor I'm interested in, which is a diet which is low in zinc. So I compared the proportions of children in the two groups who have been exposed to a low zinc diet. And I will often have several controls for each of my cases. This is a design which is particularly useful if you're, doing a, if you're looking at a rare disease and can be used to, to look at several different um, possible risk factors. But it has its disadvantages, as you can see from the, the slide. Now, a, control, a, a cohort study does exactly the same thing as the other way around. 
With a cohort study, we select patients according to their exposure and look back to see how many people in each group have been exposed to the risk factor. This is a very efficient design if it's a rare risk factor and we can look at uh, simultaneous look at different outcomes to the same exposure or risk factor. The main disadvantage of cohort studies is they take a long time to carry out and there can be problems of follow-up. So although the cohort study gives us better evidence of cause and effect, the case control study is often easier to do. So an MCQ question on this subject. New anti-diabetic agent is launched. Some concern has been expressed from animal studies that there may be an increased risk of carcinoma of the bladder associated with its use. So we're going to be given a series of design options which we would employ to examine this question. And those are the options we're being offered. I'll give you a few seconds to think about that. And if we look at the answers, basically, we're, we're, we're looking to see whether there is a risk of bladder cancer. So of all of those different uh, options, the, the simplest and quickest would be to do a case control study. Why a case control study? We can identify people with, uh, with, the, uh, with, with the cancer and a group of people who haven't got the cancer and look back, see how many of them have been exposed to the drug. Very quick and easy study to do. A and E would take uh, too long and would be biased, as would C um, and B. So D is the answer. Finally, this is the final part of the, the talk, number needed to treat. Let's look at this particular question. Number needed to treat is a very important statistic in the summary of comparative studies, and it's a good place to finish this lecture. A study is planned into the effect on risk of myocardial infarction of a new lipid-modifying agent. How do we calculate number needed to treat for this study? And we're given a number of options here. Well, let me go through the number needed to treat concept, and then we'll come back and have a look at the, the answer. I've put on here a reference to a website. The number needed to treat concept is extraordinarily important, and I haven't really got time to do it justice in this short lecture. So, I suggest that if you want more background information, that's the place to go. But basically, number needed to treat is a method for estimating the difference in the effectiveness of two interventions I'll call A and B. A will be a new test, B will be control. In order to cal calculate NNT, we need a clearly defined endpoint to our study, and then we calculate the proportions of people in the two groups who experience that endpoint. So, we calculate the proportions of people in A and B who have our endpoint, and I'm going to call those PA and PB in standard mathematical speak. And we calculate the difference in those probabilities or proportions. So, we calculate the difference between the proportion of people who have the endpoint in group B and the proportion who have the endpoint in A. And that difference gives us what's called the absolute risk reduction. How much lower is the risk in group B compared to group A? Now remember, we're interested in how much lower the risk is for A relative to the risk for intervention B, so we have to make sure we get that calculation the right way around. It's quite common to get it the wrong way around. So if you're not sure in an MCQ question which way around to do it, just go back and check which of the two groups you're looking for the, um, the, the effect for. It will be the, you'll be subtracting the, usually the risk in the intervention group PA from the risk in the control group because you're hoping that risk will be reduced. Now, MCQ questions may throw in a concept known as, as relative risk. Relative risk reduction is the, is the reduction in the risk divided by the risk in the control group. Number needed to treat has got nothing to do with relative risk reduction, so just forget that. Kind of confusing, so forget it anyway. Number needed to treat is only interested in the absolute risk reduction, the risk in the control in the intervention in the control group minus the risk in the intervention group. And the number needed to treat is just the inverse of that number. 
Effective interventions will have a small number needed to treat. Ineffective interventions have a low NNT. Now, if the intervention increases the risk instead of reducing it, then of course the intervention is doing harm. You never report number needed to treat as a negative number. You drop the minus sign, and instead of calling it the number needed to treat, it becomes the number needed to harm. So, with our newfound knowledge about numbers needed to treat, which of those is the correct definition? Well, we're given a series of, of possible answers here. The last one we can reject out of hand because it introduces a thing called number of months, which is nowhere in the stem, so that's got nothing to do with it. I'll leave you for a second to have a, have a look at those. Okay, let's have a look at the answer. The answer is D. D is easy if you just write down what a number needed to treat is. Number needed to treat is one divided by the relative risk reduction, PA, PB minus PA, the difference between two proportions. It's one divided by the difference in the risks, the proportion of people in the two groups who had the end point. So it's always going to be one over absolute risk reduction. E talks about numbers of months of study, nothing to do with the question. A and B talk about ratios, nothing to do with numbers needed to treat. C and D talk about absolute risk, uh, talk about reciprocals, fair enough. C talks about a relative risk reduction. D talks about an absolute risk reduction. It's absolute risk reduction that's important here. So that's the answer. And what I suggest you do if you want to follow that up is Past Test has a couple of questions on their website which does the same kind of question but with some numbers in. And I think if you do one with some numbers in and look at the right answer with numbers in, those concepts will become a lot easier to understand. Thank you for your attention. I hope you've got something valuable out of this lecture.